hit a couple of topics as we go through some of Isaiah. We're going to start right there in Isaiah chapter 1. Go ahead and turn to Isaiah chapter 1. Alex, will you do me a favor? Will you go get my music stand to set the stuff off the side? I'm finding that this one is a little small for me this week. Isaiah chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 24. Go right, right to it. I love it. A well used Bible knows where to go. Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah are, are some of the main, main ones we'll hit. Uh, these are major prophets. There are a series of five Old Testament books that we call the major prophets. We don't call them major prophets because their prophecies are more significant, but it's strictly the size of their writings. The other prophets are relatively small in size.
And the answer to that is, God is a loving God and He's faithful. He's also patient. And at a certain time, His justice is coming. And as we looked at last week, the things that are the early warning signs that say that His justice is coming, those alarms are going off, saying justice is coming. You have just a little time. There's a warning going out to this world that says there is reaching a point where God's patient, patience is not exhausted. He's God. It reaches an end. See, an interesting concept with God is God has no limitations except those which are self-imposed. Those imposed by His own nature and attributes and those which He imposes upon Himself. If He sets a limit, it is a limit that does not limit Him, but it is a limit that He has imposed. It's an important concept to have. God does not have limitations except those that He sets in place. If there is a time schedule or time frame, if there is a count or a number that's to be reached, that's something that God has set in place, something that He has self-imposed. All right. Three things that are mentioned here. One is judgment is coming. Two is a purging. You heard that statement there about removing the dross, removing the alloy. Those are purging statements. Where you take wheat and you clean out the junk. Where you take gold and you melt it down and you refine it. There is a refining that is going to happen in this world. And there is a restoration. See, those promises that we talked about that God made to Israel uh, for the land, the people, and the kingdom, those are culminating very soon in what, we, what we're looking at here, what we're going to continue to look at as we move forward in Bible prophecy. Um, you're looking at a time frame which will, I'll say end, but that's not a very good word, uh, this judgment period is going to culminate with the second coming of Christ. Now, can you tell me what is the number one topic, the number one doctrine spoken of in the Bible? We'll say in the New Testament. Number one, number one doctrine spoken of. I look at John because this is something that is a pet area of his. Would you like to say what it is? Second no, it's salvation. <laughs> Trick question. Salvation is the number one doctrine. Number two, the number two uh, most spoken of in the New Testament is the second coming of Christ. Out of the books of the New Testament, only four do not refer to the second coming of Christ. Three of those are very small letters, like one chapter books. And the other is Galatians, which in the first chapter, in the first verses, um, is suggestive of the second coming. But all of the rest of them highly point us to this point in time. And there's a reason. Because this event is the culmination of that first and number one topic, salvation. The restoration. Both of the letters to Thessalonica are, I mean, that's the actual thesis of the letter. Yeah. It's not just that he includes it in it a lot, but I mean, that's the actual point of it, right? Thematic, absolutely. Studying in Old, Old Testament prophecy, we see the same thing. A lot of pointing forward to this time. You'll hear the phrase, the day of the Lord. The day of judgment. Or even the phrase, the day. On the day, this will happen. Or on the day. It's speaking of a very specific point in time. Why is this important? Because this is the culmination. This is the buildup. Throughout history, we're building to this point when God does what He promised to do. Because God is faithful. Alright. Currently at this point in Isaiah's day, and currently at this point in our history, Israel has not accepted its Messiah. In Isaiah's day, they were looking forward. And today, they are looking forward, not realizing that they should be looking back. The study of, of the book of Isaiah is amazing. You find Isaiah chapter 53, which we won't get into today, is, is the gospel in the Old Testament. An amazing chapter. 
I'm in the middle of Bible study, I'll get back to you. Everyone I know knows where I am right now, so we'll assume that's someone I don't know. All right. God is a force to be reckoned with, and that's what this world is going to find out. In this culmination of judgment which is coming, we find that they not only continue in rebellion, but they continue in the knowledge that it is God that they're opposing. Even when they reach that point of realizing that it is God himself that they're opposing, they will continue in their rebellion. We'll see that beyond this tribulation period. We'll see this beyond the coming of Christ into the millennium, when at the end of that millennium, Satan is released to tempt the world one last time. And though Christ is on the throne in Jerusalem, we find that they still choose independence and rebellion to follow their own ways even in the face of God. That's an astounding thought. I, I have no idea how that's possible. We'll see. Because we'll be there. It happened in Genesis. <laughs> very, very good. Now don't get ahead of me, man. Yeah, that, we may as well go there because that's uh, in the face of God is exactly where Adam and Eve were. They walked with him in the cool evening, and they still took independence. They still, even though their motive may have seemed like a good thing, they're doing the same thing that we do in taking independence from, from God. All right. The ungodly will be destroyed because they have forsaken him. They have rejected God. Um, and they will reap shame. A beautiful... Uh, passage that we have in Scripture tells us that we will not be ashamed. You know, those, those who walk in obedience, those who walk in submission to God, uh, you will not be ashamed. Uh, but here in Isaiah we have the promise that those who do reject God, and it doesn't matter how, how they do it, because there are some who very gently and very sweetly choose other ways. Um, I know family members, extended family members, um, that will say that they love God, but they go about their life in a different way. It's not done God's way. So it doesn't matter how you reject God. It doesn't matter how. It is still rejection, and it will be dealt with. It will be dealt with harshly. It's an uncomfortable thing. All right. So a time is coming, uh, which is spoken of very much in Scripture, uh, called Jacob's Trouble, Great Tribulation, Great Terrible Day, the build-up before the second coming, uh, this time when God's judgment is going to be poured out on the earth. We see in, in, the, in the layout of the book of Revelation, I didn't plan on going here, but I guess I'm going to anyhow, Larry. Uh, we see this, this picture of, of how things are going to happen, an order of how things are going to happen. Most people I talk to uh, speak of the book of Revelation as a scary, uh, impossible to understand book. And it truly is not. If you take a literal approach and allow the scripture to define itself. We find in chapter 1 that John is receiving revelation from God, which was given to Jesus, revealed to John, to reveal to us. He sees in the first chapter uh, the revealed Jesus. He sees Jesus walking among lampstands, and those lampstands represent the church. Seven specific churches that were around in John's day. Seven letters are written to those churches. Those are laid out in chapters 2 and 3. At the end of chapters 2 and 3, you find no more reference to the church. We see an end of the church period, and a transitional phrase is used hereafter, after this, the things that come after this, that's metatauta. We find that used in the first chapter in a little bit of an outline. In one scripture it says, write the things that you have seen, that was the revelation of Jesus, the things that are, those are the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3, and the things that will be metatauta after this. So we find after chapter 3, there's a transitional point. And this is spoken of in this 
in this first chapter, there's this transitional thing. Something happens, and then something happens afterwards. So ending the church period is what I believe happens at the end of chapter 3. And we next see the church in the throne room of God. We see John in the throne room of God. And the Lamb opens the seals. Now why I say and I emphatically say that the rapture of the church happens before the Antichrist is revealed is because the first seal that's broken is the releasing of the Antichrist. These seals begin this time of judgment, this time of God's wrath. It's also a time of pressure upon this world to repent, to repent, to reject their independence and take dependence upon Christ, take dependence upon God again. We find in the study of Revelation that the vast majority do not. Though many are saved in the tribulation period, we find that in Scripture, majority do not. So this wrath is poured out. Three things are happening. People are getting saved. People are rejecting and getting hardened. And Israel is being pushed into a corner to recognize Jesus as their Messiah. This is the goal of that period. If you do not understand that the goal of the tribulation period is the restoration of Israel, you'll get all kinds of different ideas. If you make it about the church enduring, or if you make it about anything else, you'll end up at a different conclusion with your facts. So as we've studied Bible prophecy, we've tried to keep the players in their place. What is talking about the church? What is talking about uh, tribulation saints? What is talking about Israel? Is it very important that you look at who is being spoken to? Who is, is this relating to? And how things are worded is a good way to do that. In the first uh, three chapters of Revelation, uh, the names of God and the words that are used will tend to relate to the church. Then you get into chapter 4 on, you see names of God and words used that relate to Israel and to the unbelievers. So that's very telling. Uh, that the church is, is out and the focus of God is placed on Israel. All right. Welcome. This is Maddie, everybody. Hi, Maddie. Uh, works at the gym. Works at the gym. All right. All right. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 2. Actually, no. We're not going to cover that. We might cover that later. He's the pastor. I am the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> Explains the jacket. All right. Explains the jacket and all the sweat. All right. Now, as we say through Old Testament Bible prophecy, we see that Israel disobeyed. And because of their disobedience, God was faithful to punish them. And because they went after other gods, he let them. There was a separation. And we know from Romans chapter 11 that God, Paul said that God is not done with Israel. Uh, we were grafted in, and they were grafted out, and they will be grafted back in. Which means God's focus of attention, though it shifted from Israel to the church, is, hi Julie, going to shift back to Israel. That's important to recognize that God's attention is shifting because if you begin to study the book of Revelation and you begin to look at this tribulation period and you're trying to force the church into areas that are not for the church, you'll come to wrong conclusions. So to understand that God's focus is shifting back to Israel is very important. Uh, during this period of the tribulation, God's wrath is poured out. Nations turn against Israel for the purpose of pressuring them to look at their spiritual life. Now, they have other reasons for going after Israel, 
But God's point is for them to look at their Messiah. To recognize that they overlooked Christ. That they overlooked their Redeemer. They did realize or accept the fact that he's the Messiah. Yeah, uh, that is... In Hosea, we have this scripture that is a clause. God says, I will return to my place, which means God was left his place, he came here. I will return to my place until, until what? Well, he's, he's left and he's, did somebody start to answer? I say, until so his last day he come back to give people life. No, he says he's going to return to his place until they recognize, until Israel recognizes. And in, in, under this pressure of the tribulation, they will call out to him. And when they call to him, they're recognizing, not just calling out to God, but it's a very specific, they're calling out to Jesus, their Messiah. And in that call, he will answer, he will come. So there's, is, is this the reason that, that Satan has the nations trying to destroy Israel? Is silencing that voice going to keep that scripture, that clause from being answered? Perhaps in Satan's logic, that's true. We know that's an impossibility. So Israel, in this pressuring, is going to uh, recognize Jesus as their Messiah. He's, they're going to call out to him, and he will return. This is the point of... Uh, I don't want to spill too many eggs. I tend to anyhow, though, I'm worried. Okay. All right. It's hard enough. It's very hard not to because it's all connected. It's hard to teach one area without leaking into all the others. So, all right. Sorry. No, no. No, no. This is good. Take care. It, it, Go ahead. It's a bit of a rabbit trail, but just the pondering God's sovereignty and all this is just, it, it's, it's mind-blowing to me. I think, I mean, I think about that classic, that classic verse there in Genesis 50 with Joseph where, where, where God... You know, looking back over everything that's happened, his, you know, his, his, his brothers hate him. We studied this a few weeks ago, but his, his brothers hate him, and they, they try to kill the guy, and they end up selling him to some slave traders, and the guy makes his way down to Egypt, and then all the horrible stuff that happened there, and the, and, and being in prison for, what, like a decade or something, or, or more, I think it was, and, and, you know, and eventually he rises to power in Egypt, and then there's the famine, and the brothers, and, and just this whole story, and, then, and, and, and looking back on it, God says, you know, you guys, they, they meant it for evil, but I meant it for good. That, to think, I mean, think about that for a minute. Had, had Joseph not been sold into slavery in Egypt, then the 12 brothers would have never ended up in Egypt. And if they never ended up in Egypt, there never would have been an Israel, and there never would have been an exodus from Egypt and a parting of the Red Sea, and there never would have been a Messiah. I mean, the actual, the, the, <laughs> the, the Messiah, the the, the God incarnate in human flesh. The only reason that happened was because eleven brothers hated their little brother and sold them sold to some slaves two thousand years ago. To think that to think that 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 God can somehow it, I mean it, it stretches the mind to even think about. But and, and it was, I mean, and then we see that of course even in, with Jesus too. You have you know the the Romans got together with the Jewish people and, and all these groups all end up. You know, shouting, crucifying, crucifying, and killing the, you know, killing the author of life, and, and murdering him on a on a Roman execution rack outside of Jerusalem a couple thousand years ago, and yet God says they did everything that my hand predestined to take place, and and then looking forward to what to, to this end time scenario that you're painting here, you have, you know, you have you have Satan in, a, in, in one of the most you know murderous displays that he's really ever put together. As, as, as you're describing this scenario, and yet it's all in God's hands, <laughs> and, he's act, and he's, he's actually using that to accomplish precisely what he wants to. Yeah, in fact, during that time of the tribulation, you have two different elements happening. You have the wrath of the Lamb being poured out in natural disasters, and you also have the releasing of the Antichrist figure and the awful things that he's doing, all working the same path. John was describing walk, walk, walking the same path leading into the redemption of Israel in the course of those events. 
Well, put in perspective how awful that time was. The Holocaust took one out of every three Jews. The, the events of the tribulation period will take two out of every three Jews. It's a, a tremendously awful period of time. All right. Too much weight. But I'm working out, so. <laughs> really, that's no joke. Why is he laughing so hard? All right. The second coming of Christ. Uh, we will discuss in a little more detail the rapture of the church and define why scripture shows that those are different. That if you study the scripture and only focus on the second coming, uh, it can become blurry. And a lot of times when people speak of the rapture of the church, the doctrine of the rapture, uh, they'll call it Jesus coming. And so that, that terminology can create kind of a fuzzy area for people. Uh, but this is a specific uh, event in time at the culmination of things. Uh, we talked about the wars last week, and that final war, Armageddon, uh, Christ returns when Israel calls out to him in that battle and rescues them. Uh, this is a period we, we see in 1 Corinthians 15, 53. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 53. Uh, this is the doctrine concerning the resurrection of the human body. It cannot be fulfilled until Christ comes. Uh, we see that the resurrection in the rapture of the church, we also find in his second coming a, a continuation of that until the end, the final, final resurrection. Uh, the victory of Christ over Satan as promised many times in Scripture which began in Genesis 3.15, we talked about that. Uh, this promise that God would overcome uh, is completed in the second coming. Uh, and most important of all, we have this, this completion of salvation that we read about in Romans chapter 8, where the earth is groaning. You know, say, why is there disease in the world? Why are there earthquakes? Why are there famine? Why is all this stuff happening? Because the planet is suffering, just like you and I are, from the curse of sin and death. Everything is dying. From the moment you're born, you begin dying. That's a phrase uh, Lucy caught on that I say. Uh, there's death in the world because man rejected God, who is life, decided to take independence, and so everything has been dying ever since. Though when, when Christians argue with scientists that there is global warming, there isn't global warming, it's not caused because of man. And I know what they're trying to say with that. I kind of have to chuckle uh, because Scripture tells us that all the problems in the world are because of man. Because man brought sin and death into this world. At the culmination, when Jesus comes, we see a correction. God sets things right. He restores the world. He restores mankind. And it's, uh, he fulfills the promises that he has made to Israel. And this comes with his promise in John chapter 14 and verse 3. It says, I will come again. And I said, if I go away, I will come again. We have that promise in the rapture where we meet him in the air. And then at the end of the seven-year period where he comes to Israel and he comes here. A uh, big misconception people have of heaven is that you die, you go to a floaty, cloudy place, and there you sit bored in white robes playing harps. You won't find that in the Bible. You won't find that because that's that's inaccurate. Uh, what happened? This really is in my notes. We we'll, may as well go there because that's where I'm going. Uh, what happens when you die? You go into the presence of God. There is a waiting period, a place called paradise. And when the rapture happens, those who are dead in Christ will come out of that waiting period into their bodies, come out of the ground, and meet us who are alive and remain. We all go and meet Jesus in the air. We find at that moment we are in the throne room of God, which we read about in Revelation chapter 4, the end of that church period. We're waiting there, we're celebrating there with him, while hell on earth is really happening here, this tribulation period, the seven-year period.